Right, fantastic. Well, hey, I'd also like to say I'm, thanks a lot for Matt for organising this to come in. I know that you contacted us wanting to do a, a presentation, so we're delighted to come in. Uh, what we do is we do like to engage with the, the kind of engineers and the architects out there to probably give you some assistance and so you get best outcomes for clients and best outcomes for situations, uh, which is where we're at in a kind of collaborative approach. But essentially you need to know what we can kind of do and also we also need to know what types of problems you're faced with so we can, so we can do that. Uh, so hopefully as we go through today's presentation we'll address a few of these things and, and feel free to interrupt at any time uh, if you've got any, any pressing questions uh, that, we, that we can address uh, for you as we go through. Now you'll see quite an exhaustive list <laughs> that will pop up here but ultimately we're going to cover off on a few things. I'm uh, going to give you a background into uh, Zypex Crystalline Technology. Uh, we're going to address, more importantly, I suppose things that we've identified through our kind of research and, and kind of our feel for the market is look at things which affect concrete, like the deterioration process of reinforced structures. And that doesn't necessarily just mean it only affects a bridge or it just affects that. It's commonplace ac across the majority of concrete structures. Kind of quantify that problem. Uh, and kind of put you know the cost involved in these types of things. One is doing it right first time, and the retrospective cost of trying to rehabilitate structures follow down the follow down the line. We are going to address how Zypex can impact these things and how how we work within within concrete, and then we're going to do give you a kind of overview of a field field kind of test report, both on a new structure and an existing structure. And then we will look at, uh, oh, I shouldn't really say Zypex wanted to say, but we're going to look at uh, uh, doing a bit of a Q&A and maybe a project overview just that will flow through uh, when we, we go through that. So, I said meet the team. Well, I'm Johnny. Uh, I've been with Zypex for the best part of seven and a half years. Uh, worked across a multitude of different projects, uh, both in the commercial and residential sector and also within the civil side, both mining and, and also the gas fields, which have been quite lucky from the exposure to that of the recent kind of boom that you've seen in the LNG sector, and that goes both in Gladstone, upstream and downstream, and uh, more recently up in Darwin. James, I'll give you a little, like, what you have a bit of a so intro. I'm, I'm James Shedd, I'm the uh, step manager for Sidefix um, for Queensland. Um, obviously my responsibility is uh, I'm looking after a three-man team. Um, there's myself, Johnny, and then there's um, another guy that looks after the Gold Coast. Um, my side of things is to um, help these guys get their day-to-day -day going. It's no different to what you probably do yourself. Right? So um, I guess that's my responsibility. Um, you know, just appreciate the opportunity to come in here today to uh, um, obviously hopefully help you guys in finding what's, what you guys obviously find in the marketplace that's our problems that we can help solve for you guys. That's ultimately our end goal today. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, fantastic. So as I just give you, Zypex itself is an international brand uh, and has been in the market for, as I say, coming up to 50 years. So founded in Canada in 1969, a couple of chemical kind of engineers linked into the mining industry and it essentially was the designed there to shut down leaks within kind of tunnel shafts and things. From that, the products developed, and as I say, it's now approaching almost 100 countries uh, worldwide. One of the great things you get, I suppose, when you work within an organisation uh, that does have kind of worldwide exposure is the amount of uh, crossover you've got in relation to the test data for all the different kind of environmental kind of uh, areas you deal with and the different types of structures so we've got an incredible amount of uh, uh, kind of testing that is readily available uh, for most scenarios as you can imagine that's great having all that type of stuff available within you know europe canada south america but when you deal with even uh, regional queensland where you get up to say queensland you're dealing with a tropical queensland environment it's very different to what you what you would face say up in uh, vancouver or something in canada or uh, over in certain areas in Europe. So the good thing is, within Australia, as you can see from there, been on the market in Australia since 1991. So we've essentially got almost 30 years worth of field and test data and project case history to refer back to as well. One of the good things we do do as well, from a, from a material su supply perspective, the product itself is manufactured in Australia. Uh, uh, down at our 
facility in Albury Wodonga. We did move into a new manufacturing lab facility back in 2016, uh, which has really geared us up for you know, a lot of capacity and a lot more intensive research, uh, which has also led to uh, an improvement and an increase in our kind of technical capabilities in-house in relation to uh, performance of the product and performance-based specifications. CSR is something that's widespread, I suppose, throughout our organisation, corporate social responsibility. It just really means we, we, we go in there with an environmental and a social aspect to it, and we appreciate the impact that it has in society, essentially. But you see that, it's quite commonplace across a lot of, lot of organisations these days. All right, so that covered uh, really the introduction of who we are. All right, so, I mean, I suppose this just kind of summarises where we are, the kind of key problems that you tend to, tend to see within uh, reinforced uh, kind of structures. I mean, I'm not sure from you, from your guys' exposure. I mean, obviously that's not an extensive list, but essentially what we're really saying is the more porous or permeable the concrete, the more rapid these deterioration processes, processes can be. And ultimately, there are ways of addressing those uh, up front. Just put it in a bit more flow chart. So, I suppose what we're looking at is with with kind of concrete. As it says more permeable concrete, the more accelerated these processes can be. But you really need to have a combination. You need to have a combination of moisture and your oxygen, etc., for these things to diffuse and permeate into the concrete. If it's just a liquid itself, yeah, you maybe don't have too much issue, depending on what it is with the steel, but ultimately you need the liquids and the gases which cause, cause, cause the issues. Now, as you can imagine, in different areas where you, where you operate, uh, you know, you'd be subject to aggressive soil conditions, uh, and in marine zones, etc., near the ocean, you've also get the threat of kind of chloride attack. And even when you're just in those fringes, you've got things like airborne chlorides, etc. So when you look at things like chloride attack, I mean that's with the predominant, uh, predominantly the number one uh, reason for uh, early failure in concrete structures is from uh, you know, early induced corrosion uh, from chloride ions. Now, two things can happen, I suppose, when you've got attack from attack to the concrete or attack from the environment to the concrete is one is in relation to kind of things like acid sulfates and things well, that's more prone to actually bring down the, and attack the matrix of the concrete yeah so with, with sulfate attack that generally speaking will attack the matrix of the concrete and the constituents of the concrete see so actually they then lose, lose cover to the reinforcement and, and potential bit of spawning from that the difference between kind of I suppose, sulfate attack then as you go to chloride or some, something like carbonation would be with that they really have a detrimental effect more so on, on the reinforcement so in relation to things like uh, uh, carbonation what that is essentially is doing is reducing the pH level within the concrete which means essentially the, the, the reinforcement, which is normally enca encased in a high alkaline environment, is becoming under threat as the chem chemical composition changes within the kind of concrete, which means you, you, it starts the, the process of, of corrosion relatively early. Uh, with chloride ion attack, that's a bit more of an electrochemical reaction that takes place. Uh, and once again, that kind of passive layer around about the, the, the rebar uh, is under threat and you get the, the onset of kind of corrosion for rebar now. I suppose the key to that is when the corrosion process starts to take place at the steel, uh, the steel itself actually starts to get bigger, it expands. So within concrete, that steel can expand depending on how rapid the process is, up to four to five times its size. Now with that means then you get propagating cracks which then it just even further accelerates the process and you get concrete spawn, etc. Worst case scenario than that is as it's getting bigger, it actually loses cross-sectional strength. And I suppose what that can lead to are things like, you know, worst case scenario, collapse of a structure. Uh, and yeah, I mean, occasionally from time to time in some of these bridge uh, kind of web pages or on LinkedIn, you'll see a bridge collapse here and there takes place. And a lot of the time it comes, comes from that type of thing. Uh, and that's why we mentioned earlier when we were in here talking about the council looking at doing some, you know, preventative maintenance work on 
on some assets. Councils and things are relatively well aware of it. It's a bit of a ticking time bomb to see, you know, what the, how their assets actually are. But it, it's something that is currently, currently out there. Just to kind of quantify these types of things, as you say, a lot of some dramatic uh, circumstances. And I know we're seeing there, you know, the collapse of a, a kind of a bridge stroke kind of dam there. But that's not, you know, you imagine that down at, uh, it says Suffers Paradise. I mean, they've just, they the Luca building, for example. I mean, that's just been demolished and smashed down after about 30 years worth of service. Once again, unsafe, uh, it's fallen to bits. Uh, and you'll see, you see quite a lot of that out there. But the issue you've got is, is the type of costs and the money involved or involved in it. So if you look at the typical cost factor for most countries to maintain their existing concrete assets up to a, a safe and serviceable standard, you're looking at somewhere between three to five percent of their GDP. So, in an Australian uh, term, I think uh, back in just the turn of 2000. Uh, they had, or they had a, a figure in the region of about, oh, was it? Oh, I know in the US it was sort of 2.5 billion, uh, UK it was 750 sterling, and I think in Australia we were looking at some of 1.2 billion Australian dollars. So it's astronomical, well, astronomical costs uh, just to maintain existing concrete assets into, into, into a kind of safe standard. One project which I also remember being at a Concrete Institute session up in Darwin, and they were, they were talking about a similar, similar type of subject. And it was actually a bridge that was built in the UK in the well, mid-1960s. And they've just finished a, a refurbishment process on it. It took about five years, because they had to try and keep traffic moving. It was bang in the central on the Hammersmith flyover. Built in, as I say, built in the 60s for the cost of 1.5 million, and they just spent a uh, something like 76 million sterling refurbishing it. You know, you get different issues over there, you get de-icing salts, uh, you know, high density population, a lot of carbonation, but it's all, all, the, all the concrete, so maybe not the same high performance concrete, you're looking at you know, there's some strength in works. But that's the type of cost, you, you know, to rehabilitate these structures. So if you can get it right first time, you know, they've got a, it's got a huge a huge benefit, as you say, to, to the environment, because as you say, there's not a finite, amount of uh, raw materials and then when you do look at kind of things like concrete concrete is you know one of its you've got your aggregates your sands etc your other admixtures etc but essentially what you do have is a high cement content within concrete or oh, it's one of the largest portions and that's one of the biggest emitters of co2 uh, around the world and obviously as you say you, you want to avoid safety issues now this is just an abstract, as it says here, from a Vic Rose kind of department, but as you say, key things like carbonation, chloride ingress, and acid and sulfate attack are key, but you do have issues, I suppose, when you're, when you're working about, where you do still see issues with AAR and ASR take place. We do have issues where you do have chemical attack, depending on the nature of what the project would be. Uh, even as simple as just doing, as you say, you might have something like chemical buns, or you've got uh, a roof or a plant slab where you've got certain units on there that might have to deal with deal with spills. But all these issues, generally speaking, can be can be controlled or restricted by you know making it difficult for moisture to move through concrete. This particular one here delayed etchage information. Have you you come across much much of that? What that tends to be is when we, uh, it tends to be more of your higher strength concrete. So when you're getting a concrete around about 50 MPa or above, and maybe you're doing with sort of mass pores. So even if you were looking at uh, maybe even larger kind of slabs where you've got big thickening beams running through them and you've got mass pore concrete, it's all about controlling the heat. So if your heat goes, say, above 70 degrees, You've got threat of what they call delayed etronite formation. That means each etronite cr crystals don't form during the during the hydration process of the concrete during normal curing. And as it said, there's delayed reaction, so that can delay further down the line with the introduction of water and then cause like cracking and things. So it then creates a problem very similar to AAR, uh, but as I say, it's more prevalent in mass pore high strength concretes and also in precast when you're trying to get really high strength gains very quickly to move the move the elements along the along the production line quite quickly. 
So, I mean, I suppose I've covered off a, a few different scenarios there, and a few different kind of threats and threats to concrete structures. What do you tend to find that you're kind of combating uh, out there in the market from, from, I suppose, from a design perspective and as a consultancy? Probably mainly corrosion of reinforcement. Yep. That's what we're coming across. Yeah. Whether that, yeah, we made a lot of reasons why that happens, but yeah. Yeah, generally that causes falling and then yeah. you know, just, yeah, you run into problems. Yeah, that's fine. Now, do you, do you, do you get approached from it, from your clients, etc., from a rehabilitation side more, or preventative day one, day, or, or is it a combination of both? My clients are sort of mum and dads, they don't know how to do preventative stuff. Yeah. They just want to fix. Yeah. So, I guess we'll try and incorporate it in our design for new builds and alterations yep. and additions and things like that, but yeah, in terms of stuff that's already existing, they no idea how yeah yeah okay yeah that's right you know they see a bit of spalling somewhere on a i mean for example i had to deal with a client who had uh, uh older elder couple from sydney and they're coming up to their investment a couple of investment properties up in brisbane and it was an older, pro- older property around about Nogra, and yeah you know kind of concrete kind of veranda thing you know spalling there oh i need it fixed when i'm up <laughs> this week doing the doing a doing a run around and you're right, you, it, people really just don't know. It's not as if, it's not that these aren't the type of situations where you can just go pop into Bunnings and get a bit of advice because they generally speaking don't know how to address it. But it is key that, you know, as I say, there's a lot of it out there. As I say, and that's in the smaller scale residential as opposed to when you just need to look around, I suppose. I suppose down the Gold Coast is an obvious place where they've got that. But up and even around the Sunshine Coast, it's a ticking time bomb up there, around about Kings Beach, etc. And Caloundra, they've got a lot of older all the property, so it's a, it's an expanding, as you say, because we're going to have expansive forces, concrete spalling, the market's expanding as well, so, yeah. So I suppose what we'll do now is we'll look at how we can address some of these int- issues by looking at the use of Zypex crystalline technology and introducing it into the concrete. So we've got a couple of different ways of introducing it in, in, into concrete. One is up front as an admixture into new concrete two retrospectively we can add that into existing concrete and that can be kind of new or old so you can imagine if you went and did a, a concrete pour and you had an issue you, you can fix some of the issues with a retrospective coating or one is you can uplift an existing structure and then two or three sorry we've got our uh, a kind of a specialist uh, kind of repair mortars and repair scenarios that can address a good number of situations. One of the key things I suppose you'll see up there, kind of green tag, uh, our products are environmentally friendly and from our organisation, from manufacturing, production and the actual materials itself that are contained in it, we do have a gold plus rating. Now that rating itself is the highest rating you can get because you've got cement in your product, we've got, we've got a very small portion of uh, GP in a product, and because we've got that, you can't get platinum or whatever the rating is, but it does mean then if you do do a design or something, you can you know, have some level of kind of green, green certification to it. Now, you've done very well listening to a Scottish accent, I appreciate that. Uh, what I will do is going to put on a very, very brief uh, uh, kind of video here. Now, this is a Canadian accent you get, it's from our uh, parent company in Canada. Uh, so I'll just press play on this. However, upon close examination, we see that concrete is in fact a porous material containing capillary tracts, micro cracks, and sometimes macro cracks. This is a magnified view of a capillary tract in concrete. Note that the walls of the capillary are lined with the byproducts of cement hydration and unhydrated cement particles. When concrete is wet, the capillary tracts become saturated with water. Calcium hydroxide and other soluble byproducts of cement hydration dissolve in the capillary water, while unhydrated cement and other non-soluble materials remain on the walls. For existing concrete structures, the Zypex crystalline technology is applied as a coating to the concrete surface. When the highly concentrated Zypex coating comes into contact with the capillary water, 
a chemical differential is created. Driven by this chemical differential, the diffusion of Zypex reactive ingredients into the capillary begins. The catalytic reaction between the Zypex chemicals and the byproducts of cement hydration and unhydrated cement particles starts near the concrete surface, forming insoluble crystals in the capillary tract. Crystalline growth continues to develop and mature as the diffusion front progresses deeper into the concrete. The Zypex crystalline technology can also be applied as an admixture to the concrete at the time of batching. In this case, the Zypex active ingredients are evenly dispersed throughout the cement matrix, with slightly higher concentrations in the capillary water. Whether as a coating or admixture, the capillary cavity will become filled and waterproofed by the Zypex crystalline formation. Zypex active ingredients and some byproducts of cement hydration remain locked in the crystalline formation. In this way, Zypex treated concrete is permanently waterproofed, even against extreme hydrostatic pressure. And Zypex will reactivate whenever water is present. All right, so that gives you, I suppose, a little bit of an animation uh, on how it works. Cause it's always, I think, very good to visualize things in pictures. Uh, now, I know we had a zoomed in kind of capillary tract there and the, the hose or the, 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 you know, small lab, but it, and apart from that, you know, it's, it's representative. But now, if what we do have, I suppose, is some, with the laboratories and things, where you've got SEM slides, etc. so this, taken out the, out the kind of animation realms, this is now into what they call 5,000 scanned electronic magnoscopic kind of images we've got here. So just to kind of show you the kind of differences, so what we've got here, this would be your cubic and rhombic kind of par, par, unhydrated particles from the hydration process, which normally sit dormant there within an untreated concrete uh, uh, kind of element. Now, with the introduction of Zypex crystalline technology, as it mentions, the, the crystals form within the micropore structure of concrete and essentially forms within the matrix of the concrete. What happens is we start to fill all these kind of voids and capillary tracts, etc., up. That's all by this reaction with the byproducts of the cement hydration process. Now, moisture is the key component to it, or, or water is. And as you say, when it's going through that hydration process and curing, etc., that, that's when it starts to take place. So typically speaking, this would be the initiation, as you can see from these rhombic particles, you start to get kind of insoluble crystal growth. Now that takes place really within your one to kind of seven day period. And then what you start to get is a real kind of dense interconnected pouring capillaries with the crystalline maturity within 21 to 28 days uh, within the concrete structure. The key thing is there, as it says, they're non-soluble uh, crystalline, crystalline formation. And I'm not sure if you picked up an animation, it remains there locked in the concrete and is permanent there for the life of the structure. So it's a permanent treatment for concrete, uh, which is, you know, can give some real value add uh, to the projects. So it's not like something that needs a reapplication process, etc. Uh, or a retreatment is purely there and done there and then at the time it's uh, permanently locked in. I suppose these days what we're faced with, I suppose as modern day concretes and modern day practices out there, so all they are designed for what would be perceived as making concrete more workable and making concrete more durable. Uh, also making it more cost, eff cost efficient and there's a variety of different reasons. Uh, why you've seen like the introduction of fly ash. Fly ash was introduced predominantly to, to deal with issues of what we mentioned in the previous slide of AAR and ASR, uh, which is effectively combats that threat. But what it also does is allow you to have a slightly more, slightly cheaper, a more environmentally friendly concrete because it's a recycled product that's used in there. You've also seen more recently, especially in a lot of higher strength mixes, the introduction of slag and also uh, you know, the likes of your kind of silica fumes. So the key thing I suppose from a Zypex or from an admixture perspective is the ability to know if you work within these types of mixes or not. 
the good news is we've done the extensive kind of testing and we do work well and have a positive reaction with all these uh, uh, supplementary cementitious materials. We do work in conjunction with the four main concrete suppliers, if you can imagine. So you've got your Hansen or Heidelberg group, you get Borrow, you've got Wholesome, and say the likes of your kind of Adelaide Wrighton. When you go a bit further afield, uh, we do also work with all your your kind of more regional companies and your more localised independents as well. Uh, but, but you know, companies like your Wagners and, and kind of Mansells, etc., we're very comfortable with there. I suppose the other thing, though, as you mentioned before, is, is making it place, but it make, it making well compacted and walkable concrete it means you do need to use uh, other chemical admixtures. So that can be a combination. I press the button there. As you say, if set retard, those things, or, you know, water reducers, super plasticizers. You know, if you're dealing with you know, cold rooms and things, and uh, you get things like air trains. And the other thing, I suppose, which we get asked a lot, especially when we look at the the kind of residential sector and the commercial side of things, and even some of your, I suppose, some of your landscape style, aesthetic kind of civil projects is, can we be used in conjunction with things like uh, coloured oxides and the likes? The good news is we can, and we've got a kind of proven track record for it as well. The product itself, from an admixture perspective, has been extensively tested and used, and what you'll tend to see on most documentations is normally no chemical admixture can be used unless it meets AS 14, 17, 8.1 uh, standards. So we've been through all that kind of testing uh, and we, we meet, meet the requirements that see it as a, a special purpose, uh, normal setting uh, admixture. So we don't really have any, any, any negative effect on either the plastic or the hardened state of concrete only positive effects. Now, those positive effects, I'm going to quickly kind of summarise now in, in a couple of slides. A lot of this was covered in the animation, but it just kind of helps kind of re reinforce what you're looking, looking for there. So, I know I've mentioned it before, and it, you did hear it in the animation, but the Zytec crystalline formation, we are locked in there within the, the integral matrix of the concrete and the key is it is there permanently for it. So as you know probably when you maybe you may or may not have done some kind of testing in concrete, there's always a little bit of residual moisture sits within the concrete. So the question sometimes is directed to me, well, you know, surely then it's you you know the crystals would react and there wouldn't be any more crystals to react if you used up all the moisture, but essentially we will only use up the free available moisture in the reaction of the byproducts as many rooms as available at that time. However, it should there be any further moisture in, ingress into the concrete, it does have the, be, have the ability to reactivate again with it within within the concrete uh, and provide uh, uh, further growth of those crystals. Hence the reason it reactivates when the product water. Now this is quite a key one here, it increased both early and later age strength of concrete. So we do exhibit that and, 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 depend, and a lot of that's all representative of the concrete mixes itself uh, where we're in. But against those mixes we do, we do show uh, improvements in that. Now depending on the concrete mix that can vary really anywhere from about 10 to 20 percent. Okay, So if you imagine you've maybe got a 32 MPA concrete we would see, probably see a better uh, early and later age strength in region off, nearer the 20%. When you're maybe dealing with a 40 or a 50 MPA concrete, we're probably seeing an improvement strength gain nearer the 10% as opposed to the, the, the difference. Increased durability and, and through the improved permeability, the, or decreased permeability of the concrete. So essentially, if we can stop the moisture in the concrete, you can control the amount of. You know, uh, of harmful substances to, to get into the attack it. One of the other things and key components of the Zypex uh, crystalline technology is its ability to self-heal static cracks up to 0.4 mil wide. Now, just to show you here, I do like a, a couple of giveaways, and these are hot off the press, but uh, here you go, a couple of crack gauges for you. It's not all painful <laughs> today. But essentially, so Zypex will self heal static cracks up to 0.4 mil. So if you hold that up, you say, oh, 0.4 mil. But that actually, 0.4 mil is a relatively big crack when you actually look at it when you see it on a slab, uh, especially a new concrete slab. And it certainly is out with, out with tolerance of, say, a typical kind of main roads project who really get concerns anything, anything above 0.2 mil. 
So we cover more than that uh, with that. One of the things we do have, or we do have testing, is we have we have shown to shown to sell fuel cracks above 0.4 mil. I think we've got a certain test report which shows we've healed sell fuel to crack up to one mil uh, under a, a head of pressure after 70 days. But ultimately, we guarantee uh, with the you know specific. Uh, project specific etc that it's going to be 0.4 mil <laughs> similar to the increased uh, early and later day strength we do exhibit improvements in lower drying shrinkage uh, which assists with once again with the you know with the finish of the concrete uh, highly resistant to aggressive chemicals now consistent chemical range with ph3 to 11 and then you can handle splash or intermittent uh, 2 and 12. Now, you've always got to be careful when you talk about splash and intermittent because a lot of that depends on where the project is. So, you know, an intermittent, you know, would mean, you know, you, you can't get to after 24 hours or something to clean it up. Uh, but a lot of that would be contained within, you know, project scope, etc. what they would classify as how long it would be in an area for, but consistently 3H to 11. As I've said, for dead again, sulfate attack, AAR, and DEF. When we're talking about your kind of subgrade structures and kind of tanking situations, etc., so in ground kind of pits, kind of basement walls, uh, we can be effective within within shot crete as well. But the key here is, you know, we are resistant to extreme hydrostatic pressure. So with the admixture, the the capabilities of the product's been tested up to about 106.9 meter head of pressure, uh, and why that that it stopped there was essentially due to the the capabilities of the apparatus material that was used on on the particular test, and as a retrospective coating, uh, it's been tested to about 121 meter head of pressure. Now we're going to touch on this chloride protection in marine environments in a, in a, in a, in a field test in a minute, but we have, are able to show extension of life in the more aggressive marine areas, which would be in your C2 zone, you know, the splash zone, where you get that heavy wetting and drying cycle. We do reduce the rate of carbonation, so essentially, as an admixture, you essentially eliminate it. Uh, as a coating, we, we, we can reduce the, so for a structure that's already in service, we can reduce the rate of that carbonation by so, almost about 35 to 40% uh, from, the, from the, the information we've got. Uh, so many areas where you probably get car, uh, threat of carbonation would be typically things like, you know, high density residential areas and also things like car parks, structures, etc. Uh, where you've got, as I say, you might have carbon monoxide issues and you've got a bit of oxygen, but it's more when you've got the moisture to come, come combining with it all together is where you, where you really get your problem. So we, do, we get involved in a lot of car park, especially rooftop uh, car park projects, etc. Uh, one other interesting thing we came across the other, the other week was in, in, in kind of traffic car parks and especially in kind of basement areas was actually noise containment and acoustic issues. So. As you can imagine, wheel turning, etc., and normal concrete, you don't get the same squeaks that you would do off a kind of a, a more robust kind of paint or kind of membrane style product. It was just something that was uh, thought throughout there as well. Heat resistant, consistent minus 32 to plus 130 degrees. We also can cope with exposure to over a thousand degrees Celsius and to like minus 160 something degrees. Once you get intermittent, but consistently uh, minus 32 to plus 130. We get involved in quite a lot of the the the, the kind of modern day abattoir style products uh, projects just now, where there's been a methodology change where you go to what they call quick chill rooms. So it's snap chill. So you, you know, I mentioned before, but kind of. Well, I think we did touch a little bit on freeze thaw. So you think people think, oh, freeze thaw. You know, a problem with it in Queensland. Uh, well, not in normal structures you don't, but in the certain project projects you do, especially some of those ones. So, yeah, very effective in that. So that's why we get used there. I suppose when you're looking at areas where you've got issues with, you know, exposure to the UV, etc., and, and rooftop areas, etc., one of the key things with the product uh, product range is not affected by uh, lights of humidity and UV uh, and kind of oxidisation. 
We do work within the concrete, so you don't have issues that you get with typical kind of physical barrier products that you can get. Now, we did touch earlier on good concrete practice and modern day methodologies and things like that. So what you've now seen is, and it's, a, it's really is a widespread adoption of your curing compounds, your wax release agents, etc. all that. Now, one of the issues you tend to find <clears throat> now with these kind of barrier products, or for example, surface coatings and membranes is, there needs to be an awful lot of attention and detail put into surface preparation of those to make sure you get consistent adhesion and don't have any delamination issues. One of the main reasons why you do failures in a lot of surface applied products is because they haven't managed to get all the oils and latents and curing compounds, etc., out of the concrete prior to those applications. And as I say, if you put a widespread membrane on something, you get a small pinprick in a bubble somewhere, before you know it, you get, you really don't know where the potential problem could really be uh, on some of those structures. Key here is AS4020 certified, so we can be used in contact with drinking water. So we do an enormous amount of work within the, the water authority market, so both in new structures and also rehabilitative projects. But when you're dealing with, uh, I suppose, some commercial and residential projects, uh, you do have your kind of water tanks sometimes are contained in buildings and then sometimes I think under the queue, flood or whatever that code is, you need to have a, or a storm containment tanks and things. So the good news is we don't have any detrimental effect to, to water. Not that you would want to drink the storm water essentially in one of these buildings, but uh, yeah, it just means then when you discharge eventually it's not going to have any detrimental to aspects to it, you know, you're going to have issues. Yeah, I mean, this list could be, yeah, I mean, you know yourself, how I many areas can concrete can be used, I mean, so you can, you can go on and on and on, but that kind of summarises where we could, could see ourselves being used. Uh, so in your typical commercial kind of stroke residential projects, you know, in that basement area, which is normally pretty critical. Uh, and we do, we, we, know, we normally start off in lift pits, believe it or not, because that's money, buying for money per square metre is probably the most expensive area in the building. Uh, they normally go to all three systems just to, to make sure they get it right. But from there, as I say, you, you, walk, you can water yourself around in the, the basement and the ground, in that in-ground slab, the wall structures, and then depending on podiums, roofs, and kind of plant slabs, as mentioned, the water and uh, sewer market. Tunnels and subways, I mean, James himself, he's been with Zypex now just over a year, but he's got a lot of experience within the tunnel sector. Uh, fortunately, as I say, when I came on board with Zypex, I saw the, the back end of Claim 7, and then I've seen Airport Link and Legacy Way. More recently, I'm involved with the, the tunnel project at Brisbane Airport, so I've got a bit of exposure to, to that environment. But you're still dealing with similar situations, really. It's all you're doing is you've got a problem and we address that problem and, uh, and make sure we get we get the right dose rates, etc. and work within the concrete to achieve the things like a hundred year design life, which is predominant now in a lot of this. Uh, okay. <clears throat> now, we mentioned there about, earlier about uh, marine structures. I'll quickly just uh, give you through a kind of case study. So, I did mention we're very good at having lots of testing available, different environmental exposure classifications, etc., all around the world. These, these two kind of case studies, can all, both, both are in Australia, which, which would be good to know. Uh, the first one is from an admixture uh, and in, the, in, a, in, a, in a C2 C2 zone. And what it is, is just to give you, is, is give you a bit of insight into the type of testing that gets done and it shows you the type of formulas you, you get within the co in, in the in our concrete. <coughs> now when uh, both these tests were done, as it says there, just under 20 years worth of in service in that uh, C2 classification, uh, tidal splash zone. Three stress panels down at Cronulla Marina. And then we've got uh, precast concrete slabs down at the Wharf, Geelong. So typically speaking, what you, well, what I will say here is, both tests here were actually undertaken by by the clients with independent and independently verified uh, information. So I'll, 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 
I'll, I'll stress that just now. On both cases, you know, obviously they've gone in there and they've initially done a visual inspection, which is normally how most of these things start. Uh, one of the key things was there, there was no obvious signs of any cracking, uh, no rust stains, and no issue with covered spalling. Now, normally what that tends to mean is, it, on the surface it appears that the concrete's in good condition, but as we know, it's really what is happening below the surface is, and more importantly, round about how the V-bar and how that's tracking determines how you can predict the residual surface life of a concrete structure. So what this then led to was doing a bit more investigative uh, work. So what they've done here is they've actually done some destructive testing here, uh, and they've gone and taken some core samples uh, from both structures. And there we go there. And then from that, they've gone and done some chloride profiling of those, and from the chloride profile, they do half cell potential testing, etc. And then apply it to a, a calculation, which is called fixed second law, which is the the go-to equation for predicting residual service life, and then they come up with with the figure of what they predict will be the corrosion-free service life of the structure. So we'll start off with the graph here. Uh, now, what I will say here is suppose both structures were uh, designed for 50 years, and under the Australian codes, should both should have had 50 mil cover. Okay. Now one of the issues they had down at Cronulla Marina was design constraints in relation to the, to the structure meant they had to go 40 mil, which meant the, the engineer had to come up with a methodology uh, to sign off to allow him to design for the 50 year design life. So that was one of the reasons why they adopted Zypex crystalline technology in that particular structure. Now, as you can see, in that initial 10 mil, you've seen, you've seen a little bit of chloride ingress in there and chloride ion content within the concrete. Now that essentially would be what would be seen as your, your, your initial kind of skin of the concrete. So that's your, your, your surface. Now, so what Zypex doesn't do is have any negative impact essentially on the surface profile or texture of the, the actual concrete itself. But as you say, when you get into the, the main concrete element itself, you're getting negligible readings. Now really after 20 years, that, that, that's probably not so bad, but it's good looking at these things in a chart, looks fine, but what does it actually mean to, to the client? So, as I mentioned, when they do, do the calculation and take these results, we'll put all in there. Actronilla Marina, after 19 years and 40 mil cover, the corrosion free service life forecasted is 129 years. Alice Ellsworth, they just, just just the nature of the structure and the testing that was done, they, they took a wider range of samples and that averaged out there at 164 after 90, and that's, I must stress, that's after 19 years. So what, what they decided to do after that was do a little bit of cross coloration back to a previous lab test that had been done, just to see, well, how, how does that relate to what we had pre previously kind of told the market? So back in 2004, they engaged the University of New South Wales uh, to do some testing on, a, on, on, on some high performance concrete. So it's 40 MPA, 38% slag concrete. So on that experiment, as I say, uh, just for a normal 40 MPA, 38% slag concrete, the predicted corrosion free service life would be something like 42 years. Now that doesn't mean the structure is going to fall to bits, it just means that's when you'll get the initial onset of corrosion that take place. With the addition of Zypex Admix in this controlled lab environment, they had the forecast there of 147 years. So when you then go back uh, and cross colorate it, we really are be able to clearly exhibit both in the field or in a lab that you've got 100 years extension of service life. Uh, in that type of environment. So comparing that to the case study in Cronulla Marina, so take your 19 years and add your 129 onto it, 148 years. So once again, that almost identical to your, your test environment. But bearing in mind that's at reduced cover. 
when you actually put it into context with Australian code and the appropriate cover, you're actually seeing that type of extension. So you're looking at about 130 years uh, worth of extension service life. Now, I was pointed out to me when one of the first times I presented this, so, so well, that's okay. There'll be nothing else down at Coronel Marina apart from your pontoon in a few years. <laughs> there nothing else there. But as I say, that just lets you see the type of performance we do, and, and we do spend a lot of time investigating it now. We do have the testing itself is, is readily, readily available on, on our web page, and we do have all of testing that can, can be drawn out. We do have documents which summarise a lot of the testing, in, including these type of results, but the things we mentioned are again about sulphate attack, chemical attack, exposure to sulfuric acid, etc. We've got all those, those types of things uh, test, test well and truly available. And as I say, what we do like to do is work collaboratively with engineers to achieve the desired outcome for the client and, and the project. Yeah, there you go, it just shows you uh, there, just a bit of a shock tactic uh, thing in there, I suppose, but essentially what this is, it's, uh, these are cylinders, concrete cylinders that have been soaked in a, I think it's a 5% sulfuric acid uh, solution, as you say, for 70 days. That structure there has nine times more mass than that has after the 70 days. Uh, so hence the reason we are, we are using a lot of a lot of chemical chemical projects and in a lot of a lot of sewer projects. Obviously, enclosed sewer becomes a different a different thing with your threat of microbial attack. But certainly in the in areas where you've got that chemical attack, where uh, we, we use quite predominantly. Done a lot of work with the likes of your Incitec pivots and a lot of your ammonium nitrate facilities and the likes of your Orica, etc. Right. So what that does is that's just Look at that, it's a bit of warranty stuff there. Where's this going? There we go. So, from crystalline formation to sustainable concrete. But essentially you can make, and as you see, concrete is, you know, it's one of your number one uh, building materials used around the world now. And, as you say, uh, what you can do with concrete now from a design perspective, people can, you can achieve design in concrete without kind of compromise, I suppose. So what we're saying there is, you get, by introducing crystalline information into concrete, you reduce porosity and cracks within the concrete. What you can then do with the, if that is you restrict and reduce diffusion of liquids and gases in. With that, durability performance increases, which means the service, expected service life increases, which means long term, uh, you've got reduced cost and environmental impact. So even from an asset owner's perspective, if you can reduce a kind of maintenance cost to them for having to maybe reapply a roof membrane or re, you know over the life of the structure, it's got quite a decent uh, kind of long term saving to the saving to the client, uh, and it means it's something they don't need to program into into a kind of ongoing maintenance schedule, uh, which you get. I mean, as I say, we work a lot within. Within certainly a lot within the council and the asset owners in there maintenance scheduling and kind of planning, planning environments. And as I say, with the introduction, I suppose of the, the likes of BIM modelling, they're trying to get more of those type of figures put in where they can put you know the the long term costs. And there's a lot of it still in its in its infancy as far as that's concerned. And they're using BIM for other things. But yeah, we're working working in conjunction with a few guys and projects like that. So I suppose I'll throw it out there if you've got any, any kind of queries or any questions. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple. Yep. Um, I guess we're always trying to reduce you know, required cover, and usually we do that by increasing the strength of the concrete itself. Yep. Um, whoever did the, the Cronulla one obviously have reduced the 40 mil from 50 with whatever concrete. Um, is there some sort of testing or some sort of data on how to go about reducing the covered reinforcement? You know, in terms of AS3600 to still comply. Yeah, you know, that's, see, that, that, that becomes a challenge, I think, because ultimately, and it makes good, good sense to your question, it's one that does get thrown up quite a lot, 
it's ultimately from a designer's perspective, from an engineer's, it really you're the ones who either need to design to the code or override the code if you, if you can do with the use of it. We would certainly be able to support you with information that may be able to get you over that line, but it's whether, you know, it would cross it. But yeah, we, we do get asked, that. trust me, we get asked all the time. I was involved in, in a project where in the particular area, 90 oh yeah some uh, it was about let's say 90 percent of these in-ground pits were b2 classification due to the other zone was classified c2 and there was a national local change in cost of these two pits and also on cover so from the precast perspective all of a sudden he's having to change mold and everything else so there was a real appetite shall we call it to let us use an introduction for an ad mixture now everyone agreed it was a good idea the asset owner said, no, it's fine, we're happy with it. Their third party superintendent consultant said, that's fantastic, that's great. Just need to get make sure you get the sign off for it. But there then was really the problem was you had everyone wanting to do it, but then getting someone to actually sign off on it was difficult. We, we certainly came up with design statements to say, yeah, we would, we would predict based on what you've got there, that the, we would expect to see this environment and you'd be able to meet but once again, it was just uh, just a timing thing, I think, with some of the... Yeah. And the other thing, so you're saying it's reducing permeability of the concrete itself. In terms of sort of, and you're saying that it's working at a you know, 100 and whatever head of pressure, but, I mean, would you warranty, say if you're putting in an indoor pool or something, would, and you have, you know, Zypex in your admixture, would you then be able to provide a warranty for the builder who is putting that, that into... Yes, now, that, now that's quite an now. I know this warrant, I know you saw me just... You know, they would always do a membrane and huff. Yep. No, we, 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 in indoor pools, especially in high end housing, or when you've got, as I say, pools on decks and you've got, you know, mm. yeah, the, 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 sometimes put movie rooms and all sorts of, yeah, we do warrant these types of things, not a problem. Now, so they can just put this admixture, I mean, they've yeah, the yeah, I'll just, I'll just, can I, I do it, yeah, just job, it's very, very simple to be fair. Now, as I mentioned, we work with uh, all the major concrete companies, but this kind of just summarises it to be fair, here, right? So basically what can happen is, so when we, when we deal typically in a commercial residential structure, and in Queensland, this thing works about here, mm. the Queens, the QBCC Form 16, so what that really is, as we know, is, 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 is it's a licensed trade who carries out the work and inspects the work and says it's fit for purpose. So who, who are these? Are they right. from Zypex? Yeah, yeah. So what we've got is we've got fully, fully trained and approved applicators who do plant QA and site QA. And what they do is make sure that everything goes to plan. So they come to the Yeah, you come to the and they pour the concrete. Yeah. Now what that means is they issue uh, the Form 16, depending on the nature of the job and what the client's looking for, because sometimes the client just wants that. That's, but most jobs, I think we normally issue both and we warrant the issue, we issue the warranty as a manufacturer. Is there a minimum thickness that you need for the Zypex to work? Or is, you know, if you're using a uh, thin wall sort of pulled or something for whatever reason? Uh, now, generally speaking, we should we should be fine. We, we've been involved in it. I mean, I think we do. We, yeah, in certain projects, we, we've seen wall thicknesses and all that. I don't know. Doing one just now in a short creek wall. I think you're somewhere between uh, maybe sixty or seventy mil or something. So, yeah. yeah. If you're talking about typical wall thicknesses, maybe well, yeah, one hundred. Yeah, one fifty mil. You won't have an issue at all. Uh, till on that, uh, and I say we we get used in a lot, a lot, a lot of kind of pool projects. And as I say, when you're dealing with a lot of the, the re, I suppose the higher end residential projects, but they're working on smaller plots and they used to be, aren't they? So you can incorporate a pool within that structure, but you still use underneath. So yeah, we, no issues at all with kind of warranties and the likes there. As I mentioned before, we, we do like to engage one with, I suppose, the design engineers on the job. But more importantly, you need to have the collaboration, I suppose, with the builder as well. Yeah, well uh, know what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, they, they, they you know, you know, this commercial reality set in, but the commercial reality set in, well, wait a minute, you know, where is the risk here? Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, you might save a couple of dollars here, but do you actually ever save a couple of dollars, really? Because, I mean, they're tied to projects and things, so, yeah, we, we, we don't mind issuing warranties now. 
I think across the board, I think the QBCC Form 16, I think it's a standard kind of seven year thing out there. So we tend to go in line with the standard, but if a builder or a client is specifically wanting a longer term warranty, that can be that can be assessed by our technical team and we do issue them for longer than that, but it all depends on, on the actual project itself. But once again, it's just about engaging with us uh, due to the nature of that. Like for example, I'm, I'm working on a project just now, they're doing the Nudgy or oh, the Gregory Terrace project there, they get the new Mount Sion building, so they're building over the, 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 the swimming pool down below and I think it's a three level structure and then they're going to have a childcare facility and all that, so they're doing a huge kind of open air kind of roof deck and thing there, so they're going to, half of it's going to be conventionally reinforced or half's going to be PT. Everyone's a bit nervous, but it has been designed like a bridge structure. I'm saying to myself, well, I've seen a few bridge structures in the time that there a few issues, but it should be okay. But yeah, so we so we have already got something pre-arranged for that for 20 years, but that was done way, way back mm. at, at the design stage. Uh, uh, to get to get to get yeah, everything does it through. Make the workability of the concrete any different? Yeah, well, when I, when we put up the the fourteen point seventy eight point one special purpose normal setting admixture, when you zoom into the details there, so what we tend to see is a, a, a slight set extension time of between forty five to sixty minutes. Now, what that means is you get improved workability of the concrete. So, one of the comments you tend to get is, "Oh, we we'll make it a bit more creamy and." Roughly, so people get a lot of time with it, but it just depends on one, what what time of year you're working, how well organised the concrete pole's been, because sometimes these guys just want off and off as quickly as possible. They're not really worried about, you know, how the, what the finish of the concrete is or all the rest of it. So once again, you just need to have all party parties involved. In a, in a larger project, we we do like to. Have a, a have a pre box or a pre or, or be or, or be asked to be at a pre pour meeting just so that we can address some of these some of these issues. But we do like to look at using things like aliphatic alcohol if required, or at least they've got it on site, uh, and definitely curing compounds. Uh, very rarely do they, they, does anyone have before the time to do seven days wet curing because you know what it's like before you know it, turn your back they're already loading up the slab. <laughs> it's uh, quite incredible. So. Yeah, we are, uh, we're happy with that. But yeah, that's, that worked out quite well. But I, as you say, we, we do we do normally submit of work with with the concrete companies and kind of all the builders around there. And uh, I say, you know, from the, the larger scale civil projects to, as I say, the, the smaller kind of residential projects. But I find equally the more equally is enjoyable to be fair because some of them have all got their own unique kind of challenges. And I'm doing a, doing quite an interesting one just now up at uh, Noosa right at Park Road, so it's right beside the National Park. They've got a, it's just an off form coloured concrete kind of house essentially, but yeah, a bit brutalist to a certain degree, but it's, uh, they've got a huge cantilever pool. So essentially the pool just can't, I wouldn't say cantilever's over the car park, but it's got that kind of impression. They just, mm. so yeah, it's, it's been quite an interesting, interesting one there, but some, I don't know about you've experienced, but there seems to be a bit of money around just now in some of the higher end, I mean, I know they might not want to spend money, but there's a lot of money in high end housing just now. So, we've certainly seen that. You've got your pockets typically, so we do a lot of work down at Byron, if you can imagine, and then up at kind of Noosa, that had top end of Noosa, but poor. Some of the money that's getting spent, you think, Phew. and some of these aren't even for permanent residences, they're for the occasional, occasional weekend fly in homes, you think, my goodness. Yeah. So we'll just uh, there you go. Just kind of summarise it. We, we, like like any organisation, you use a bit of social media. We, so we are on LinkedIn. You can follow us. We t we tend to update that about every eighteen months. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. It's not that we're not that uh, frequent. <laughs> but yeah, we, we 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 occasionally will post things on on LinkedIn. Any any kind of value valuable kind of products or updates. But well, the key thing is we are supporting performance based specifications. Uh, and yeah, we like to engage there. But the, the key thing for myself is we, we, we can and we do extend the life of concrete assets. But the driving thing here is this re reducing future kind of maintenance costs. So as I've mentioned, it doesn't matter whether you're the council who wants to keep the cost down or you're a homeowner or you're a property developer. 
you really don't want to be having you well probably develop or you might sell an asset on whatever else you still don't want to have you know maintenance costs and then in the initial period time that you need to go back and keep fixing because it's become painful especially for the people that are in those in those kind of buildings uh, and as I say we do work with other organisations like you know your West Farmers uh, the kind of Aldi group and the likes for a lot of their kind of structures and things as well.